Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Without Rules webinar on developing connections with your deaf, disabled and neurodivergent audiences. Um, I'm really looking forward to speaking with, um, with you around this topic and to just break down some of those barriers and assumptions and just thinking about how we can do some best practice here. Um, so in terms of this webinar, it's about an hour and a half, and uh, it will also be bearing in mind that uh, there will be uh, elements for Q time for Q&A at the end. So please do put some questions into that Q&A function uh, so we can check that or, um, yeah, or just uh, we'll just have a chat at the end as well. So I'm really looking forward to that. So um, for our schedule, Kat's going to chat around the audience development support and that, how that's available and what that looks like. Uh, and then I'm going to talk around unpacking the audience journey through your outdoor arts events, specifically focusing on a, uh, the fund that we received in 2020 and how we've built on that over the last year. And then Ross Boa Williams, uh, creative producer at Mind the Gap and Walk the Plank in association with Emergency Exit Arts, is going to talk around uh, the long game and reflections on building a community cast for the show Zara. And then Nikki Miles Wilden from Dada Fest is going to talk about developing audiences to inspire the next generation of disabled, deaf, and neurodivergent artists. So, Kat, I'm going to pass over to you. Hello everyone, uh, welcome today. Um, so I've brought everyone together today um, to talk about um, audience development Without Walls is offering some support this year as we have done before um, to partners within the Without Walls network and that's across the Artistic Directorate and the um, Tully Network Partnership um, to apply for up to um, £3,500 uh, in funding support to support audience development projects. Um, this is for activity um, covered across um, between April and March 2023. Um, I'd welcome you all to apply for up to £2,000 um, for this fund. Um, and you can also tag it onto any arts award and digital engagement activities. Um, for any projects that are over £2,000, we'd expect you to kind of include that arts award and digital engagement activities. Um, and we really encourage you to be as creative as, as possible with um, this fund as well. Um, to support your data collection and insight into your audiences as well, um, partners can apply for up to £350 towards data collection support. So if you've got any um, ideas around that, if you'd like to do anything creative with that fund or would like to um, investigate your audiences further through Audience Finder, do give me um, a call and I'll talk with you about that further as well. Um, as I mentioned before, so partners can um, also do arts awards. So if there's anyone in your team that needs art, Arts Award training. Um, I can also um, arrange for you to um, apply for funding support for that. So that's up to £150 as well. And you can now do that Arts Award training online. Um, so the deadline for this um, application is Friday the 4th of March. So you've got a little bit of time to consider that. And part of the reason we're doing the training today is to hopefully inspire you um, in your projects. And we've got a couple more sessions coming up as well on different topics to help um, help you kind of bring your ideas together. Um, partners are really encouraged to apply early this year and that's because this is our final year of our MPO funding. Um, so as you can imagine, um, you know, we really want to spend that budget and we really want to support you as much as possible. So what I'd recommend is um, do let me know as soon as possible whether you'd like to apply for this fund now or whether you'd apply, like to apply later in the year. And um, that way it helps us kind of manage who um, might want, want what funding at what point during the year and help us budget that as well. Because um, obviously I want to ensure that you all are able to be supported as much as possible. Um, so next slide, please, Alex. Uh, if I could just ask you to do your uh, visual description as well, please. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry about that, everyone. Hi. Yeah, so I should say I'm Kat from Extracts. Um, and today I am wearing a black jumper um, with a roll neck top. Um, I have long brown hair, blue eyes. Um, I've got a pinkish reddish lipstick on. And I am a white woman in my early 30s. So continuing on from that, um, I just wanted to give a bit of an overview of the kind of projects that we support and what we don't support. 
Um, often audience development is um, sort of linked to kind of marketing activity and things like that. So for me, it's quite uh, paramount that we kind of investigate how that funding is being spent and that it's really going towards audiences and not just supporting sort of general marketing activity. Um, so some examples of the activities that we can support. So we can support, um, you can put these funds towards outreach workers, ambassadors who might help you to kind of reach a specific community or develop a relationship with them. Um, it might be that you want to put this money towards specific engagement activity around a particular Without Walls programme or show. Um, you might want to um, host a series of workshops for a specific community, or you might want to use this money um, in the kind of realm of today's topic to um, use it to support reaching disabled audiences to make or to make an event more accessible. We've supported a number of um, partners in the past and um, to support them to reach disabled audiences. And this has been either by, um, you know, implementing different access at their festival, making it more accessible, or it might have been actually, um, you know, bringing in certain elements of technology, for example, to help um, reach a particular audience and enhance their experience. Um, we also support participation projects of so bringing different communities together, so different groups um, to kind of get involved in a project or perhaps share their own kind of creativity or co-creation in a project. Um, Without Walls um, audience development support can't be used to pay for performance and on fee costs. So, for example, if you're bringing in um, a Without Walls show, for example, that would be paid for separately through um, your sort of Without Walls grants. Um, we also don't use this money to support data collection, as I mentioned previously, um, that's a bit of a separate fund. So if you're interested or need extra support for that, just talk to me, we can support you for that in a different way. Um, and then also marketing activities. So we can't, you can't use this to pay for um, just, you know, print or kind of advertising, things like that. Um, if it links in some way to your work um, and you think, you know, I really would like to incorporate some kind of marketing, to reach a particular audience. So it might be, um, for example, creating easy read um, documentation around a particular show, something like that. That is relevant. Um, what I mean by marketing is just something that you would normally be doing to promote your, the events at your festival. So again, I really encourage you to just come to me and talk to me um, about what your ideas are um, and we'll work together to um, produce a really hopefully brilliant project. Next slide, please, Alex. So this is just an overview of um, some of the audience development and engagement impact that we've had over the past year. Um, this isn't just specific to access projects, however, I think we supported around five projects this year to uh, reach disabled audiences. Um, you'll see we supported 15 partners, um, which we're really proud of, particularly in the context of you know, COVID-19 and ongoing restrictions. This work is really valuable to us, we think, to kind of keep reaching out to audiences during these difficult times. Um, and this is just an overview of some of the, um, the impact. So in the past year, for example, we've reached over 6,000 audiences through kind of specific activities with priority communities. Um, and again, we hope that um, through this fund this year, we can reach even more um, to demonstrate our impact as a network. Um, next slide, please, Alex. So as I mentioned, we've, um, today is one of three sessions, training, training sessions to support you in your audience development applications. The next session coming up is around audience finder and practice. Um, this session will be with Rosanna, who's our um, new consultant at the audience agency, who's gonna be working with you and be a direct contact with you to help you with your data collection strategies. Um, she's gonna talk about how to get you set up for the year, but also how to use that data in advocacy as well. Um, to hopefully kind of help make the case as you go forward to build on your events in the years to come or perhaps funding applications or maybe with your local authorities. Um, and then after that, on the 27th of January, we're doing a session on developing your audiences through Arts Award. So again, think of today, if there's any ideas that come out of projects, how you might link them to the sessions coming up. And if you've got any questions, please get in touch. Um, and that's me, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Kat. And uh, yeah, and also a huge thank you because Kat really supported on um, when we applied for our audience development fund uh, for the last two years as well. And I'd really recommend just having that chat. Um, and it's just so useful to talk through because often you have to, you get this kind of blank page where you have to create some ideas um, and having that chat is really useful. 
Um, so uh, I'm going to talk around this audience journey. I'm Alex Cavell. Uh, I'm a white woman with medium length brown hair in my late twenties and I'm wearing a burgundy dress. So in my role as access producer for festival.org that run the Greenwich and Docklands International Festival, uh, I work to make sure that the, uh, or to enable the festival to be as accessible and inclusive as possible, thinking up uh, some strategies, working with audiences and most of all, thinking around what we can do to break down some of those barriers and create some really person-centered, exciting, creative opportunities. And within that, I also work with uh, Without Walls as their access consultant, and I'm here for conversations as well. So I'm really looking forward to either visiting your festival or yeah, just drop me an, an email and we can have a chat through some, maybe some of your plans for audience development as well. My email is just alex at festival.org. So I think it's always useful to start by thinking about what we mean by access and inclusion. So starting off, we've around 21% of the UK define themselves as disabled, which is around 14.1 million people, of which 12 million people are deaf or hard of hearing, over 2 million people are blind or partially blind, about 1.5 million people are known disabled or neurodivergent. And thinking around that, so that spending power um, of disabled people in the UK is estimated about 80 billion pounds per year. Access means finding ways to ensure that fewer people are excluded. And within that, even if um, we're just thinking around the basics of, as an outdoor arts festival, we want to be reaching as many people as possible. This is a really key audience demographic and it's vital just to not forget about this demographic, not to forget about disabled people and to include their voices and creativity within your work and audiences. I think it's really exciting. The more we can do to um, make our work inclusive, the better. It's also vital to consider this uh, from, the, uh, from the perspective of the social model of disability. Of course, there's many other models of disability and there's also new ways of looking at um, disability and new models being created all the time. Um, as a really basic start line, uh, I think the social model is a really useful tool to consider. So this just means that whilst people may have health conditions or impairments, they're disabled by the barriers that exist within society. And that's the key thing. It's the barriers that are created by society that are already there um, that we might be unconsciously making. So really considering those barriers rather than putting it onto the person. So some examples of these barriers can include environmental, so a lack of ramps, uh, easy to read information or lifts, but also in our outdoor work. So thinking around gravel, like that can be a real barrier. Uh, thinking around uh, sites that are in really complex places to reach, really confusing descriptions of how to get there. Thinking around those complexities of your site in particular. Um, and then attitudes, thinking around prejudices, those assumptions that we make, uh, stereotypes, and also hate crimes. And I think that's a really key thing uh, from some of my conversations with festivals in the past. Um, a real high number of disabled people have experienced hate crimes um, in public spaces. And when we're reclaiming these public spaces through our creative practice, our beautiful outdoor arts, thinking about the history of that space and how that space has maybe um, got some negative memories there and how what we can do to rebuild that uh, trust within our work and uh, the work in that space. And also thinking organisational. So thinking about inflexible practices, policies or procedures, making sure that all of your practice um, and all of those policy documents include uh, disability. So looking at your, um, for as a real basic example, thinking about your evacuation plans. Have you included disabled people in those plans? Just really considering um, that you've considered uh, disability within all of your practice. Um, and yeah, broken down those barriers and made real positive ways uh, of working with people so that you've got more disabled people in your organization as well. So I think this is also a really useful uh, demonstration of what that could look like uh, through a visual form. So you've probably seen this uh, equality image. So this is an image of uh, three people of different heights uh, watching a baseball game behind a fence all of them in the equality image receive a, the same box. 
therefore there you've got our shortest person in that image not being able to access that uh, baseball game uh, and then in the equity image we then give two boxes to our shortest person one box to our medium-sized person and no boxes to our uh, tall person in that image and that's looking at equity so what we're doing to make adjustments for that person I think our real key thing is to think around the social model and therefore thinking around those barriers and also like what is the best thing for everyone uh, and in this image that's described as liberation and that this image shows taking away that fence looking at that barrier and our three people are cheering and also get to access more of the uh, baseball game and it's far more exciting uh, everyone's much happier in that final image once the barrier has been addressed but of course it's not always that easy and um, it's not always as obvious as just taking down a fence or putting in a ramp there's there can be far more complexities to uh, to this so in 2020 um, GDF was really lucky to pick the August September moved our festival to August September and were very lucky to be able to run a festival that year uh, a really modified festival that included more included more installations um, but also had the opportunity to reflect on that moment so we looked at more about the climate crisis and around uh, the effect of COVID-19 um, on our health service and also we uh, built in some work around uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and developed our work of black um, audiences and uh, creative theatre makers as well. So that was a really useful practice, but also enabled us to think around um, how we could do audio description in a really in a COVID safe way and touch tours and thinking about how we could uh, engage blind, partially blind, visually impaired audiences. So for this, we applied for the Audience Development Fund and received funding to um, create audio description for our um, installation. So this included an installation for Luke Jerem's Gaia, and which was uh, which you could actually listen to on our SoundCloud. So have a look for the GGIF SoundCloud, and then you can listen to the full um, audio description. All of our audio descriptions are still stored on there, so please do check those out. And what we did was we linked a, a QR code to our posters and flyers, and, um, and that was a way for all audiences to be able to access that audio description. And for us, that was a, a real way of um, making audio description more visual, uh, encouraging more audiences to um, be aware of that um, audio description, because audio description is often in someone's ear, is very, um, is very invisible. And to promote that and to um, many audiences may not even know that they need audio description. So finding that as a tool uh, could be really successful and also um, shows to other audiences, maybe they've got a friend or family member uh, or a colleague who would, um, would need that and um, brings in more audiences through making that, that more vis vis uh, visible. And then thinking around those, um, we had a really positive uh, response from that and um, and received really high numbers on our um, SoundCloud, but it's also difficult because we didn't know who that was reaching. We had also a really positive uh, response. We built a an audio tour into one of our events, um, which was a, a smaller version of Greenwich Fair. And that uh, had a, a touch tour element and then three shows that were audio described. Um, in person and with headsets provided by Vocalize. And this also was a fantastic tool to uh, meet audiences. We uh, put in place meeting at the nearest station. Um, I communicated with each audience beforehand, so they signed up to the event, and then we communicated where they were traveling from and where the best point to meet them was. Um, it was very personal, and that personal response, um, that personal action received a really positive response. So then leading into 2021, we really listened to this feedback and, um, and one of our key things is around that consistency and building that practice, um, building and making better. So therefore we use the, that audio tour format. We already had these lovely uh, audio tour signs, which are pink uh, signs saying audio tour and then the AD logo on. 
And we built those into Greenwich Fair, Dancing City and Healing Together, which are our three main events at GDIF. Um, in particular, we had a really good uh, uptake from Dancing City. Um, this may have been because we had three very specific shows that we were going to see, uh, including a touch tour. Um, and those shows were shows that uh, two of those shows were without all supported shows that had uh, created audio description through their um, through their funding uh, of uh, audience development and access provision. So we were already using some uh, addition. We'd built in some of what the way that was uh, funding. We'd built that practice within to our work as well, which is great. Um, so this. Dancing City was fantastic. Unfortunately, we just didn't have the uptake for Greenwich Fair and Healing Together. So we're still trying to work out exactly what that was, but we think it is because with Dancing City, the station is quite hard to navigate in Canary Wharf. It's difficult to navigate the multiple shows and having this clear list of shows that were, um, which had through audio description that was available to everyone to listen to on their own devices, plus a touch tour was a really exciting offer. Whereas with Greenwich Fair, it's um, the station's much easier to find uh, for the site and healing together. Again, we didn't have as um, in depth an offer. Um, some audience response from this was that it wouldn't have been possible to attend and experience any of this without a guide. It's great to have this access in place and we'd never found our way otherwise. Another person said that this was amazing. Uh, the audio description made them cry. They didn't think that would be possible. They've, avo I've, uh, they've avoided watching dance for years because they love it so much and were afraid that it would make them sad and not be able to experience it fully. But this description showed, and the show was so fantastic, it made me want to watch dance all over again. So that shows how vital this is to, um, for someone who has not experienced audio description and felt like dance and theatre was no longer for them through our work being free, often free uh, and outdoors um, so therefore less um, COVID uh, difficulties there it's a real easy environment to pick up the uh, an audience and to audience to try it in a really exciting way when thinking about that reaching the audience um, some key things to put in place of this marketing plan um, and you can include in your budget the audio flyer and thinking about uh, putting that on your, but then also thinking about putting that on your website, how you market that and reaching individuals and building that provision with your audience in mind. Um, some groups that we worked with were Blind in Greenwich, but then also posting on Facebook groups and um, and I'd also really recommend, and something that I'm wanting to do next year, or this year, is to um, have an outreach worker go to some group meetings uh, or run pre-festival sessions to really break down some of the questions and, um, and be able to answer and, yeah, any of those questions around that audio tour and audio description. That wraparound offer uh, is really vital. Those touch tours, the uh, Q&As, consultation, being involved and included in your event mean that you will retain your audiences and build a strong relationship. Um, I'd also recommend, uh, where possible, offering shadow opportunities. So Extant are running a shadow director scheme where they're having um, blind and partially blind directors, shadow directors, uh, at different events and we offered that for one of our shows and then that um that director then came to all of our other events uh, which was fantastic uh, and meant that we had uh, someone who came to all of our um audio description events so thinking about that wraparound offer is really key not just doing the audio description but that wraparound and then as a festival i think it's really key to consider that awareness training for all of your for um all of your staff but in particular, your um, audience facing staff. Um, so book in some awareness training and making sure that all of your team are really confident with guiding, confident with knowing about audio description, what it is and how important it is. In particular, those your volunteers or stewards, it's so important that they know that there's audio description there. Um, this was still something that we uh, with having we had around we have around 120 volunteers so making sure that everyone knew about the audio description could sometimes be a challenge uh, but it was really 
you, we had, you have to include it in every briefing note, uh, making it really clear. Um, because audio description, um, because of our QR codes, um, that for us, it isn't actually the best practice, but um, it was something that was cost effective for us and as a, um, in a negotiation for that. Um, it means you have to have your staffing on board with teaching, how, of showing how to use that QR code. That's really vital. Um, and then also thinking about that kind of marketing that you do. Um, so for your festival, if you have a, um, a festival promo video, making sure that that's audio described. So thinking about your content on your website, making sure that you've got alt text on your photos. There's kind of really basic things, but actually, um, if you're providing audio description, you need your audience to be able to access your website um, and access your content and access all of your marketing provision. So really bear that in mind and uh, build this into your planning, cross over with different um, uh, departments in your team and making sure that access is a priority for everyone in your team, not just one person. Um, yeah, so I think those are my uh, key things around that. And there's so, I've, I feel like these last two years around this has been such learning, um, in particular listening to our audience. So really listen to your audience, try and get as much feedback as you can. Um, and although maybe we had, you might get quite low numbers, you, those interactions are so vital and can be so, so meaningful. Um, in particular, this, uh, our touch tours were, uh, yeah, really meaningful. So my key learnings uh, are being person-centered, really listening to your audience, build and develop each year. Um, if, if you're thinking that maybe this year you need to be doing alt text, this year you need to be doing your um, building that baseline, start by doing that. I know that this, it's so busy. So build each year. Don't feel like you have to do everything at once. Maybe offer one show that's already described. Um, but also if you can do everything, do put that on the table as well. If, you've, if you can, um, if you're applying for this fund and you're thinking about audio description, this is a real good opportunity just to go for it. And then that consistency, um, making sure that everyone in your team knows and making sure that if you're doing it this year, uh, you can try and continue that in the future years as well. Um, so I think, yeah, that's everything from me. Um, and I just think, want to thank you so much for listening to that. And if you have any questions in the Q&A, please do drop that into our Q&A section and we'll answer that at the end. So, hello, Ross. <laughs> I would like to bring in uh, Ross to this conversation now. Um, I'm really excited because I was lucky enough to go and see Zara and had a few friends and colleagues in it. And it was such a brilliant experience. It was so layered in its access provision and so in depth with the community provision um, and really working with community, uh, the community and thinking about the, um, the message. Oh, I love this picture that Adam and Terry in there as well. Yeah, great. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much um, for that um, intro, uh, Alex, and for your presentation too. Um, hi everyone, my name is Ross. Um, I am a white uh, man in his mid-30s. I had to actually think then. I have brown hair. I have uh, uh, a fairly smallish beard. I'm wearing a burnt red peachy shirt with a whale on. And um, yeah, I think that Pretty, sum, pretty much sums me up. Um, so uh, I am a, a creative producer and I had the opportunity to work on uh, this amazing project uh, called Zara, uh, which was a co-production between Mind the Gap and Walk the Plank in association with Emergency Exit Arts. I'll be kind of using this as a bit of a case study to look at uh, the community engagement elements of this project but before I start I have to apologize I have a very basic uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, but I have littered it with some really stunning images that were taken by professional photographers and hopefully that will detract from any grammatical or spelling mistakes you might see but you get bonus points if you spot those um, so uh, to begin with uh, I'll just say kind of what what drew me to 
to this particular project, um, I've always been attracted to quite bold and ambitious and seemingly unconceivable ideas where artistic excellence collides with strong participatory practice. For me, Zara is the perfect and most purest manifestation of how all of these connect where heart meets spectacle. During this presentation, I'll be shining a light upon what was considered the most successful, one of the most successful aspects of the production, which was the community cast and the community engagement. This presentation will look at the processes and the learnings that enabled the team behind Zara to successfully engage and meaningfully involve communities in London. At the heart of this exploration is the provocation. What is authentic community engagement? And how do you steer away from tokenistic tick box engagement? My disclaimer is that this case study is by no means a silver bullet. Uh, this presentation will focus on um, things that we drew from it, key learnings, but it also looks at pitfalls, things that we would do differently and hopefully kind of leave you with some tangible takeaways to implement uh, for any of your kind of projects or events that you uh, might have coming up in future. Uh, so hopefully all the, pre the presentation will work. Let's give it a go. Perfect. Uh, so Zara was a giant co-production between Mind the Gap and Walk the Plank in association with Emergency Exit Arts. This large scale outdoor theater event was for the whole family and told the epic story of one learning disabled mother and her fight to protect her baby called Eva. Zara was the brainchild of Mind the Gap's artistic director, Joyce Lee, and here is a short clip of her explaining Zara and its origins. So let's see if it works. Fingers crossed. Hello, my name is Joyce Lee, the director of Zara, a huge outdoor performance happening in April and May 2019. So where does Zara come from? Back in 2015, I had this idea of supersizing the issue of learning disability and parenthood through a huge outdoor performance. And this is a very huge, big dream, and the issue itself is very complex, so that we created a project called Daughters of Fortune, and within that project we made Anna a forum theatre piece and Mia a touring theatre piece. And these two performances reached thousands of people in the past few years and got awards along the way as well. With the success of these two sister projects, we are very excited now that to present to you Sara and it is actually becoming a reality. Sara is co-produced by Walk the Plank, an outdoor arts specialist, and Sara is Mind the Gap's biggest project yet. As the proverb goes, it takes a village to raise a child. Sara is no exception. There are over 200 people working towards this project over UK and Ireland. We are very excited to present to you, Sara. Keep an eye on our website. Apologies if the sound is a bit temperamental. Um, for the there's one more video, and if that. Uh, is an issue the sound for the next one you can turn it off because it's more about sharing visuals um so um uh with zara it had a, a soaring musical score it had a community cast of approximately 100 people it had cherry pickers tanks 3d projections and a seven meter tall mechanical moving baby called eva zara was a one-off unique experience that took place in the peace hall in halifax and in the Geraldine Mary Harmsworth Park outside the Imperial War Museum in London. Um, if you're struggling to conjure up what that looks like, uh, what all those elements look like together, um, here's just a very quick video to illustrate Zara in all of her glory. Let's see if this one works.
Um, hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a flavour of, of Zara. Um, so as Joyce Lee uh, said, it took uh, a village to raise this baby and the community cast uh, were a huge part of that village. Uh, Joyce, when she was describing the project to partners and how we adopted kind of explaining it to communities and potential uh, community cast members is it's somewhere between Godzilla and the Paralympic opening ceremony. Sitting in these big woe moments of spectacle was the desire to involve local people, 100 people in fact, 100 in Halifax and 100 in London. People making spectacle and people being a genuine part of that spectacle not the bit in the background or to act as the stage filler. For the purpose of the rest of this presentation, I will use London as a case study. Uh, the desire was always to have an integrated, inclusive community cast with and without disabilities who lived, worked, studied and resided in London. The cast needed to feature people of all different kinds of experience, life experience, arts experience, cultural experience, the whole gambit. We wanted this opportunity to circulate beyond the arts bubble and find its way into communities where the people are. The challenge that this uh, in particular uh, was for those who had little or no experience of what outdoor arts was, what a spectacle it would, it would entail, was to not only communicate that, but also how do you communicate the ambition and the story of Zara and what the offer would be for that community cast. This consideration went into everything from marketing materials to rehearsals. Essentially, it's really hard to pithily explain this kind of story and the way it would be told in one sentence. One sentence just wouldn't do it any justice. Um, on the screen now, you'll see some screen grabs of um, material that we used for publicity uh, posters and flyers. Uh, this also went online, uh, but we also kind of went old school with this. And it's really interesting just hearing Alex's previous presentation about how we could ev make these materials even more accessible. And that would 100% be our wish of doing this next time is how we could translate some of these materials and make them uh, more accessible as long as as well as I should say sending these materials we also spent uh, a long time uh, meeting with groups of varying needs and kind of spending the time uh, describing what these experiences would be because we knew that we can't just rely on someone to find us on social media or to find that that flyer so um, this is I suppose some of the key information that was was shared, but also how we try to celebrate uh, the project and also ensure that we were conveying expectation. As we said, it was it's quite abstract when you explain it. Um, the invitation uh, to participate uh, was addressed to, as you'll see here, individuals, but as well as to groups. As this was a voluntary commitment, it was vital that individuals and groups knew what would be in it for them in a, in a general sense and what the time commitment would look like. It's important to say we didn't have a rigid schedule in place. We knew the performance dates in London uh, and we knew when the dress and tech were, but beyond that, we didn't have a set schedule. Uh, this for us was one of the elements that we really wanted to celebrate with this project was how we can make this process more humanistic. So we had our artist availability, but in terms of involving the community cast and ensuring that they were brought into this process, we actually worked with them uh, looking at a series of options that was based on their commitments. Um, and that might be life commitments, work commitments, and those options varied from evenings to weekends and a bit of a combination of both and democratically with the community cast, we kind of found the best way of structuring that because we wanted them to feel at the centre of this rather than if they couldn't do our, our schedule, then they were out. So that was quite a big um, key learning for us. Um, in terms of the community cast, we had four sections that we invited people to participate and take a role in. We had radical protesters. These protesters were fighting for the rights of Zara to keep baby ever. We had the army believing that it was in the interest of the nation to separate mother and child. We had the peaceful protesters, a choir that sings a lullaby to Eva. 
And finally, we had the biohazard cleaners, a troop of dancing cleaners brought in to clean up giant poo and a uh, mess of a giant baby, shall we say. Um, quite varied roles, to say the least. Uh, with the exception of the peaceful protesters, the other three segments of the community cast would be mass choreographed movement sequences. Even though the majority of these movement sequences were already choreographed, the community cast had the creative agency to imprint themselves in the production in these sequences and also imprint on their community. The recruitment of the community cast began in November 2018 and moving beyond the usual channels of sharing opportunities and socials and websites, it was clear that we would need to support, uh, we'd need the support of partner to advocates to help us spread this opportunity. Personalised comms went to arts organisations, charities, libraries, community centres, colleges, schools, universities, councils, and we even managed to find Facebook groups of ex-Olympic and Paralympic opening ceremony performers who were on the lookout for the next big spectacle to partake in. The key lesson we learned with working with partners, in particular the arts partners, was to be clear on what the ask was of them. The ask for partners was to share the opportunities with their community, not just their participants who they would engage on a regular basis. It's fair to say that this was met with at times some resistance as the ask to share the invitation was sometimes seen as us poaching their closest assets, which were their uh, participants, their community. So it was vital that we were explicit with the partner advocates what this project entailed and how it could potentially be something which could extend and further enrich the participants and communities experience, rather than replacing the provision. Finally, for those members of the community who weren't regular engagers, we spoke about how the arts partners could be put into the legacy plan. So at the end of Zara we could direct our community cast to other places and other organisations to carry on their creative uh, journey. So it didn't just stop with Zara. Um, as you will see uh, as part of this slide, which uh, is populated with a lot of logos, um, we made the strategic decision to host the initial community cast sessions at some of the advocates venues, starting in a space where the community felt comfortable. This slide shows you where, who some of the arts partners we worked with and below them you'll see them the groups uh, that brought participants as part of a, new, a provision. The groups who wish to attend we insisted that they came with a key contact from those organisations um, and they either stayed with that group for the majority of uh, the community cast and the community engagement or they stepped out at a particular point. What this image doesn't show you is that the individuals who came independently, the members of the community cast who were nurses, uh, accountants, gardeners, retired grandparents, the everyday kind of people looking to get involved um, and something that their curiosity led them to. And the community cast can be broken down into three essential phases uh, with there being an additional phase so phase one uh, was the recruitment and give it a go sessions we made the choice that each of these sessions we didn't want people to feel like a number so we invited um participants there was normally about 15 participants would come to these informal kind of briefing sessions and the idea is to kind of share zara share those headlines to kind of convey the abstract notion of what an outdoor spectacle is how a giant baby fits into this story and also to kind of just talk about um their time commitments but essentially a big part of the session which i'll go on to uh, in a second is to talk about understanding the the message of zara um, and it's also important to say that this was not an audition uh, moving on to phase two, should they wish to continue, which they did, which is fantastic. This was uh, an opportunity where they had uh, rehearsals and it was eight to ten rehearsals with uh, a lead practitioner and some support artists. And we 
offered the community cast the opportunity to choose their roles they would participate in uh, these weekly sessions which would take them up to the performance week and then phase three was the opportunity to bring all of the community cast together and mind the gap a week before the performances and we got the opportunity to kind of stitch it all together and this uh, phase also included the uh, tech and dress and then two performers uh, performances I should say at uh, outside the Imperial War Museum. Um, so just to rewind and to talk a bit more about phase one. With the messaging of Zara needing to be the leading light, it was essential that community cast also understood that their participation and agreement to be part of this project was to serve a bigger purpose than just sharing a stage with a giant baby, as cool as that sounds. Uh, the precedent was set from the start uh, and we these intimate uh, sessions that we run um, weren't auditions, but everyone needed to understand the messaging of Zara. Many were surprised and relieved to discuss Discover that they just got the part by being there. We discussed, we watched, and we discovered together the silent injustice which many parents, uh, sorry, which many people, me included, had no idea was out there in the world, ripping babies from parents and tearing families apart. Some were angered, some were shocked, but whatever they felt, it was important that they felt it, as this would set them apart from just being a cast of puppets they became a community movement and they, their participation became more than just turning up to rehearsals. They imbued this message. They shared it with their friends, their families, their communities. I, I heard so many, on so many occasions, I should say, um, conversations that went along the lines of, yes, it has a giant baby in it, but you do know why we're doing this, don't you? And they just became the best advocates, not just for this process, but really kind of bringing a light to this, what I felt at the time was quite an untapped or, or, or secret issue that's happening in society. Uh, in addition to learning about the purpose behind Zara in phase one, we also spent time trying to convey abstract ideas. What would the performance look like with the elements added in? How could we play with scale without having a giant baby in every session? So we played with toys. A lot. These toys accompanied us to every rehearsal and it allowed the community to conceptualise everything from their positioning to what to expect. The toys helped to make the abstract less so. What I've learned is that projects such as these take time, a lot of time and a lot of patience, and so they should. People matter and there's a responsibility to pave the way to safe participation and opportunities for the community to take risks. One of the most challenging puzzle pieces came in the form of finding a choir. Um, unlike the open recruitment process for the other three segments of the community cast, there was a desire the fourth segment uh, would be a choir that would sing a beautiful lullaby written by uh, composer Sarah Llewellyn. So I started a targeted recruitment. I'm pretty sure I contacted every choir listed on pages one to 30 of a Google search. And everyone came back and said something along the lines of, thank you, uh, but this isn't something that we usually do. That is until the mighty Tina Johnston from Blackfriars Settlement replied. Um, and her email read, and here is said choir. This is the Nightingale Choir, absolute legends. Uh, so Tina Johnston said, thank you for your invitation. It sounds great, but I have to let you know that some of us sing high, some of us sing low. Some of us sing out of tune, and some of us can't remember the words, but we enjoy singing. Perfect, I told Tina. You're right up our street. Congratulations, you've got the gig. This, of course, could come across as sounding like desperation, uh, as you could say they were our last and only hope. But I'm pretty confident, even if we had a selection of choirs, we still would have gone with the Nightingales. It was never about polished excellence. It was about giving people an opportunity to try something that they'd never tried before and to ensure a variety of different people were accessing these, um, these projects. Phase 2.5, uh, which is the optional uh, arm of our, our model, was to act as, I suppose, a bit of an experience extender. Uh, for me, this became one of the most vital mechanisms in adding more dimensions and depth to the community engagement experience. 
This phase encompassed attending inclusivity training run by totally inclusive people, an invitation to watch Mind the Gaps Forum theatre piece, Anna, and to participate in stitching a giant quilt together, prop making, and of course, a wrap party at the end, uh, looking at legacy elements. These additional experiences helped to create and strengthen a community within the community cast, and it affirmed the importance that was placed on learning, learning in all of its forms. I could spend the next few hours talking about all the other corners of the project, but I also uh, am mindful of time and also I want to let you know how we achieved uh, what we did. The budget for the entire community engagement element of this project was approximately £35,000. This covered all aspects from artist fees, materials, resources, transportation costs, food. In terms of the people power from EEA, uh, who worked tirelessly to make the community engagement happen, it broke down as follows. So this is kind of, I suppose, the blueprint that then also would have happened in, in Halifax. Uh, so the producer was, was me. Uh, it's important to say that this wasn't a freelance contract. This was part of my um, uh, role as creative producer at Emergency Exit Arts. Um, but I've also kind of given some indication, not just for my time, but everyone else's time, what they approximately spent on it. Um, we had associate producers that worked with uh, me, especially on phase two and phase three, as it was quite a, a huge operation. Um, we had one lead artist and movement director, many of you who might be familiar with uh, this person here, the wonderful uh, Manuela Benini. Uh, we had seven associate artist practitioners who did approximately 15 days each on the project. They would work with Manuela and the community cast in all phases uh, of the project. And what was really important for us is that we assigned uh, artists that would consistently engage with those community uh, members of the community cast so they really got to to know uh, the team and who their um, who their artists were that they were working with and we also had four support practitioners who we worked with for the final phases of the project and they are there to essentially do all of the things beyond just artistic engagement it was just making sure that everyone's needs were met just making sure that everyone uh, felt comfortable that they felt supported if they needed anything extra beyond uh, what they were currently engaging with us that the support practitioners could could work with the community and we also had volunteers we had four volunteers uh, for dressing we had two volunteers who are access champions on the days of the performance and we had three volunteers Tears who also helped to sew the giant blanket for baby Eva. Um, an extension of the community engagement came in the form of artist development, which was never a plan, but it kind of happened organically. Sardines Dance Collective are an inclusive dance company run by Charlene Lowe and Laura DeJajo, and the collective were already part of the radical protesters. Some members of the collective had experienced separation from their birth families and were keen to share their experience within the narrative world of Zara. We worked with the collective to submit a grant for the arts bid to allow them to develop a curtain raiser show for Zara. And uh, here it is. And it's called Don't Drop the Baby. And here they are in all of their glory. Um, and I'm mindful of time, so I'll just also kind of share the other key takeaways, some that I've talked about in the, the body of the, the presentation. Uh, but the other key takeaways, just to kind of reflect from this experience, uh, was the importance of learning people's names. Um, we never wanted people, we set ourselves, I suppose, frameworks. And one of the things within our framework was people were never to be made to feel like a number. We needed to learn everyone's names, not just myself, the artist team, the associate producers, the whole kind of operation behind uh, the community engagement. And what was really important with that is that we always personalised uh, communication, communication in all its form. We never did block emails. We, we um, bespoke emails. We made calls. We always wanted people to know that they were being addressed as individuals, not just as this whole conglomerate. Um, the other point I've kind of talked about um, a bit within the presentation is if the schedule doesn't fit the people then it's your responsibility to change it i do know it's easier said than done sometimes especially when you have other factors um, to play with but for this i think if we didn't take that uh, personalized approach we would have 
lost half of the community cast from the get-go so i think spending time to make sure the schedule fits uh, the community um better if if we had longer time to recruit and this would also speak to to the point i made earlier about making the materials uh, more accessible as well um we uh, we started in november 2018 uh ideally if we had those tools we could have um embedded more considered thinking uh especially with making those materials accessible so i think that would be a better if if we did it again um giving community access floats this is something that we learned along the way and this was an oversight and learning on my part is that when we knew that certain members of our community cast needed uh access uh whether that's kind of transportation or liaisons to come with them to the sessions um a lot of the time they'd have to pay for those costs up front before they access that provision so for us we worked with our finance team at eea and we assigned those people that needed it um, an access float they didn't have to ask permission to use that we gave them this float and we just check in with them throughout the process to make sure that um yeah they if they needed a top up we would give that uh, if there's anything else that we needed to put provision to, that was a great opportunity for us to do so. Uh, legacy. Um, what was really important is, as I said, at the start of the process, we thought about what the journey was going to be for the community cast after they finished their experience with us uh, on Zara. So we did speak to a lot of those uh, partners and we really spent the time kind of mapping out what their offer uh, is in the communities that they and the corners of London they were coming from. So we could already go this, you've really enjoyed this. Let's put a bit of a, a signpost and put all these people on your radar. So when we had our, our final wrap party, we had some of those people come talk about their uh, projects. A lot of these projects they could access for free, but it felt really important just so it, uh, we kind of had a bit of a, a baton handing over moment and they could fan their flames in other directions with other organizations as well so that felt key uh, insist on welfare and community support uh, sorry insist on welfare from support contacts um some organ uh, some individuals were coming from uh groups uh, these groups uh with charities and a lot of uh, these individuals had uh, a lot of a, a, emotional needs that unfortunately we couldn't always support them with and it wasn't right for us to take that role on for supporting those needs so there were uh, moments where we had to be quite um quite clear about how and when we bring those organizations or those groups back into the fold um and for us to kind of have clear communications with those points of contacts so um they could continue to support those individuals and just make sure that their needs were met in the right way rather than us trying to kind of take on all of those things which just ethically also didn't feel right um and then my final two points are my question is do you need to audition people um i think not but the other schools have thought i think from talking to the um, community cast there was a lot of hesitance for them to come forward to begin with because they uh, felt quite nervous about being put through a process and I think a lot of them came with uh, an idea of to get into this experience we're going to have to jump through this hoop this hoop and this hoop and I think just to know from the beginning this is not an audition this is an opportunity to learn more and should you wish to continue we'd love to have you part of this felt like that opened more doors for people than them feeling like they didn't have a, the, the right skills to come to this uh, opportunity. And um, I think the final thing is any future project that involves a community engagement or community cast, I would definitely look at what that optional engagement is. So I articulated as phase 2.5, that was just so invaluable in just in making them feel more included and also it's optional to, have that extra dimension to continue that learning and for them to invest in the project and the story and the experience even more so i think the optional engagement defining what that is and having it is is key um yes i think that 
probably brings me to a natural uh, conclusion. Um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to share if you would like to find out more about the project, I would direct you to um, Mind the Gaps website and they've got a, a brilliant project specific part of their website that gives a bit more uh, history and behind the scenes kind of videos where you can also meet some of the community cast that we engaged as well. Uh, thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Ross. Um, it's brought back all the memories. I really, yeah, I love the show. And I was so grateful that I was able to bring a, uh, a group to see the show as well. And uh, their responses were just fantastic. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. We'll have, a, we'll have some time to chat off afterwards as well with Nikki. So uh, I'd love to bring uh, Nikki into the conversation. Uh, Nikki's going to do a, uh, a short presentation for us. And uh, Nikki is um, Joint Artist and Director of Dada Fest. And Nikki, are you still, or is it previously Associate Director at Grey Eye? Uh, that's previous, I think, September, yeah. And, uh, and which is where I met Nikki and uh, saw a lot of the amazing work that Nikki was doing. Uh, and also is uh, just a brilliant fantastic, and fantastic director, performer, practitioner, and a great person to work with. So thank you so much for speaking, Nikki. Oh, thank you, Alex. I feel like I've got a lot to live up to now. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Ross, as well, for your fantastic presentation. Um, yeah, hello. I am Nikki Miles Weldon. I am a white woman. I have bleached white hair. It's long on top. It's actually behaving itself today and being a bit flat. Uh, shaved on the side with my light brown roots coming through. I'm wearing black glasses. I've got brown eyes. I'm wearing a black top with a grey cardigan over the top because it's a bit cold here in Manchester. Um, behind me is a bookcase and to the other side is uh, a lovely curtain that is uh, hiding the beautiful sunshine in Old Trafford. Um, as Alex said, I am the Joint Artistic Director and CEO at Dada. Uh, I work alongside my uh, work colleague, Grace Ung, and we joined Dada in March 2021. Dada is based in Liverpool at the Blue Coat. It's uh, disability and deaf arts. Uh, we are a cross art form incubation and creative uh, producing hub, working primarily with disabled deaf and neurodivergent artists. Uh, we also have uh, every other year, so it's a biennial festival, and 2022 is our Dada Fest International. Uh, and this year, part of our programming uh, is that we're going to have our first outdoor festival in June, and then that's followed by our kind of indoor festival in November. So we've got quite a busy year ahead. Uh, we are also part of the Without Walls Artistic Directorate. Uh, I am a disabled woman. Uh, I'm a theatre maker for both indoor and outdoor work, um, theatre director, workshop facilitator, basically Alex gave you my CV. Uh, and my focus on my work is to make it as creatively accessible as possible and to think about how access is, is a creative opportunity. It really feeds into my vision. Um, from the very start of the work I create, it sits alongside and is part of my, of my art form. Um, and also through my work working with Grey Eye Theatre Company and also now with Dada, how as the entire organisation from marketing as well, we make everything as accessible as we possibly can. Um, and I'm going to talk about developing your audiences to inspire the next generation of disabled, deaf and neurodivergent artists. And this is really, really important. I think of uh, disabled artists when I was growing up, there was probably about, I think, or oh, let's see if I can do four. There was probably Matt Fraser, um, Mick Scarlett, Lisa Hammond and Francesca Martinez. Um, who were on Grange Hill. Those are probably the four that I had. Now, if you start to look around, there are many more coming through, sort of uh, Ruth Maidley, Liz Carr, Shirley Houston, Melissa Johns, quite a lot that identifies female, which is great. Um, but we could do with a lot more. And it's really important to think about inspiring the next generation of artists. When we look at uh, the joy of Rose Aisling Ellis on Strictly Come Dancing back in December, 
Uh, she won Strictly, the first British deaf person to, ring, to win Strictly. Um, she definitely raised the profile of deaf performers and the use of British Sign Language as well. And also how Giovanni talked about having to adapt his practice to make it accessible for Rose. Um, I remember uh, seeing much on social media around the time, but one that really sticks in my memory is of a young girl um, who when Rose won, she literally was crying with pride and was like, I'm like Rose, Rose is like me. And her mum had put how she's really proud now to show off her hearing aids and to identify as being deaf. Now I know the work of outdoor arts means that we might not get 9 million people viewing our work. But let's not forget that with the beauty of outdoor arts, this is real key to reaching wider and, and new audiences. And I really would urge people to, to think around the importance of that, not to hide away the disabled artists, um, not to kind of look at us as inspirations or freak shows, but to really embrace us, embrace us and make us part of your sort of main program. I'm really old school. I've got my presentation on pen, on a pen and paper. So if you see it just wafting around, I am sorry. Yeah, make us part of your main program. Be proud of having us involved. You can be part of raising the profile of us as disabled artists, as well as your festival. And by sort of raising the profile of the disabled artists, um, and it is a bit of a process doing that, um, and raising the profile that your festival is inclusive and accessible, it, I always first refer to it as that great Kevin Costner movie of the late 80s, early 90s, uh, Field of Dreams. And the big saying that goes with that film, if you build it, they will come. And that is what it's about. You aren't going to end up with loads of all deaf, disabled, neurodivergent audiences to start with, but you can if you implement it bit by bit. Um, you will build up that following and your audiences will increase. A, a big thing, I think, is around, and I think um, Ross hit on this a little bit, around engaging those choirs of people going, this isn't for us. I would also ask you as an organization, and I always ask this to disabled people as well, is to check your own internalized ableism because it does exist. We do all have it. We live in a world that's made for non-disabled people. We're made to feel that being disabled is a bad thing. Get rid of all of that. Disabled people are worth, as Alex said, is it 80 million or whatever it is per year? But also we we just we're just worth it. I'm full of all the slogans today, you can tell. Um, so yeah, think around how you feel about work by disabled artists. Why do you feel like that? Why do you think it's other? It isn't. Time to stop thinking like that. Um, and also by engaging with the disabled artists that you're programming, uh, you're gonna you are gonna increase your audiences. If you can, uh, because the disabled community is quite large, the disabled arts community is really supportive and celebrates the work of other disabled people. Therefore, they can help you. Uh, if you know you've got some disabled performers or there's a show that's disabled led, tweet about it. Ask that company to retweet it. Their followers will then start following you. It's a way just to really build that up. Um, so, yeah, how are you going to do it? I would say um, engage in conversation with your audiences and your artists. Um, if you do have disabled, deaf, neurodivergent artists coming as part of your festival, engage them in conversations. Maybe work with them. Is there a workshop they could facilitate to bring in different communities? Um, get them to retweet. Could you do, uh, could there could be a little bit of a kind of um, social media takeover? Um, uh, at Dada, we are um, looking at how we use our social media. Um, we have our YouTube channel and it's currently under development. Um, our tagline at Dada is try, develop, become. So you can try to be an artist, you can develop to be an artist, you can become an artist. You can try out Dada, you can develop your relationship with Dada, you can become an audience, a patron, whatever you want to be. 
So we've got eight fellows at Dada who are um, deaf, disabled, neurodivergent artists, cross art form, who were um, developing their practice. And for our Scratch Festival back in November, they were trying out a piece of work. Therefore, we're making season one of our YouTube channel um, along that theme of try. Uh, we interviewed all the artists uh, and this will help them build and raise their profile and it will also direct audiences to their work and their audiences to our channel. It's kind of that cross pollination, isn't it? Uh, I keep saying cross contamination, but it's not that. Um, and each season we will follow those artists on their journey. So the next season two is going to be how it's being developed. Season three is what it's become and whether that it's become an exhibition, a production, an installation, a digital disruption is all really, really valuable. So have a think around what do you have available for this platform? It could be as simple as a Zoom interview. Uh, what's what is there that's uh, accessible to people? Um, find out find out what you've got. Think about it. Uh, is there a festival Instagram channel or social media takeover? Because as I say, us disabled artists, we have followers. We will retweet it. It will get retweeted along the line. We'll put it on Facebook. Um, it because we understand the importance of bringing our community in to see our work. Again, this links back to that, the role models. We all remember how, you know, how we possibly didn't have those role models growing up and how we need to wind in that. So don't be afraid of us. Another thing we're doing at Dada, um, because we're really keen to engage the next generation, is looking at TikTok. Um, we're, we're looking at how we use this, how we can engage our young company to use it and reach a, a much younger audience. Um, and it's a real, social media is a way for disabled people to really feel connected as well. Um, I, I think it's, it's been really key in the pandemic of allowing people to have conversations, um, to start up random Zoom conversations uh, and meetups. It started up a lot of really good artistic collaborations actually. So I'd say that's a really strong thing to use. Um, it's also interesting when we think around outdoor work, we think, well, it's outdoor, um, it's gonna be safe from COVID. It's not. And for many disabled people, we've been shielding for coming up to nearly three years now, really. There are some people that have not, not two years. How many years? I've lost track of time, basically since March, 2020. So yeah, two years shielding. Um, have not left houses, staying in because that fear of, getting COVID is, is really massive. We don't know how it is going to affect our health. Therefore, I think another option is to look at what a hybrid connection could be to those audiences and, and those communities. Um, so with a project I did with Drake Music last year, uh, it was called Planted Symphony. It was a sound walk um, using the Echoes app. Uh, it was music and narration around a big installation outdoors. Um, so as you move from installation to installation using your phone, it would pick up a different GPS signal and move you along in the story. Um, we had BSL translation as pre-recorded videos that was linked to this app, which was a new thing for Echoes to think about. The app, make, the app makers, sorry. And it meant that BSL translation popped up at the same places as well. So deaf audiences had access that way. There was also the use of sub packs that deaf audiences could use to feel the music. Um, we also built in to the narration uh, audio description. So it was really clear what the installation was. It was all part of the same story. Everybody got it in the same way. And, and what was great with Planted Symphony, we had the in-life version, in-person version, and then we also had the version on a website if you couldn't take part. It gave you instructions on the website, what to expect if you were coming to the event, and also if you weren't able to come to the event, how you could listen to, to the narration. And that was, that was a key element as well of including audio description, because that allowed those people at home to have, a, to have an understanding 
of, of what potentially the installation was like. They could see the images and this would help um, develop that picture even further. Um, the Planted Symphony website was the name, Planted Symphony, so it was easy to find. Um, so I would really think around how you could develop a hybrid version of shows as well. Um, and I think with Drake, if we had more time and more money, um, we would have really, you know, one idea I wanted to do was, was there a way we could do the kind of um, 3D, the panoramic images of the space, which you can so easily do on mobile phones. Can we link that up to a website? So there is that real feeling of people being there. They can explore it. They can zoom in, they can zoom out. Um, is there a version where it doesn't rely on digital? Can you can you send letters? We were even thinking at times of sending packets of seeds out to people that signed up so they could um, potentially grow their own little garden. So I was, yeah, be as creative as you possibly can. Um, it's access, isn't it? Being in a, being a creative way. That's what, that's what we really want. And what can you as festivals offer? What can you build upon? What artists are you working with to bring other people in? Um, it's also, I would also say, and Alex is great, can offer advice on this, is think around, is there a visual guide of your festival site? You could put up on your website anyway. Um, me as a wheelchair user, I'm always keen to know where I'm going, what the terrain's like, where can I park my car? All of that. Um, and could that be could that be a visual guide, but could you also um have somebody doing it as that audio tour? Just what the what the festival site is like. Um for us at Dada, uh, with our Scratch Festival, we live streamed all of the events. They were in person, but we also live streamed them, which was a first for us. And that had, um, it was captioned, live captioned, uh, also British Sign Language interpreted and live audio description. Uh, it was a little bit messy, but that was us trying it out. We know there were some things we didn't get right, but we know how we're going to develop it so that we can. Um, we then put those online so they were available for two weeks. Um, and we're looking at how we're going to develop this for our outdoor festival. How can we live stream the events? Is there a way we can put them online uh, so people can go back and watch them? Um, you know, we are, we are going to be living with COVID for a long time. Therefore, we really need to think about how we can adapt and reach new audiences. What are the exciting, creative, accessible ways we can do that? Like I said, if it's not digital, what could the offer be? Let's not also forget that disability is intersectional. Um, being disabled, it affects everyone. Um, for us uh, at Dada, we really need to do better at that as well. Um, and we are currently working with Black Gold Arts on a, on a project. Uh, and this is new for Black Gold Arts as well, because they're looking to diversify the artists they work with in the fact that they want to, as us at Dada, we want to work with more artists who um, identify as global majority. They want to work with more artists who identify as deaf, disabled and neurodivergent. And it's really exciting for both of us to think about how we how we reach those communities, even with our call out, um, and how we're going to evolve the demographic of our audiences for both of us. Um, so this is very much a working progress. But like I say, I keep coming back to that. If you build it, they will come. It's that thing of we're going to do little bits and we're going to just keep at it. Someone called it um, the other day. It's called abundant thinking. So it's not um, we can't do that because it's what if we do this? So it's around you're working in abundance rather than kind of decreasing what you've got. Um, and I think that's a really positive way. I don't know if I've described that correctly, but it is that feeling of let's thinking, let's have a, an hour of abundant thinking. How can we progress it? Um, there's also, I think what's also key to engaging uh, and inspiring artists is think of who you've got uh, within your audience network that you know of. Um, could you, could you, uh, do you know a dis local disabled artist or a local disabled audience person? Could they help you set up a kind of artist advisory group 
where they could um, they could be part of your kind of audience access group. Uh, think around what artists you want to bring in. They might have knowledge of disabled artists that you don't. Um, they could help feed into what the access of the festival is like, um, who, who you could reach um, on social media, etc. So that would be one thing I would say. Think about setting up that. Um, again, that's a slow approach, but it will you'll really reap the benefits of it. Um, how you put messages out on social media. Um, so think around uh, if you're doing a call out, can you do a BSL translation of it, like a BSL trailer, a flyer? Um, how do you do audio description in your call outs? So maybe not just as blank text. Could you could you do could you have somebody voicing them over? Um, PDFs aren't great for visually impaired people. It's best to put things out in a Word document because then they can enlarge the text if they need to. So yeah, I think you could have, you know, yeah. How can you audio describe your call outs? It's really quite exciting. Even if it's somebody reading it, um, that's, that's made something instantly more accessible to a, a visually impaired or blind audience. Um, and I would say, I'm gonna wrap up now because I'm conscious of time but also look at other companies and organizations and see how they're doing it. Look at people like Disability Arts Online, Unlimited, Grey Eye, Dada, Definitely Theatre, Daryl Beaton Productions, Extraordinary Bodies, Birds of Paradise in Scotland, Access of Areas, Mind the Gap, Hijinks. Look at their call outs, what are they doing? Ask, get in touch with them, see if they can help you um, reach wider audiences. They can retweet, they can put stuff on Facebook. Um, I will put the list in the chat function. Don't worry, I will do that now for you. Um, but yeah, as I say, I keep coming back to it. It's slow process, but it's all, if you build it, they will indeed come. It's just not being in our culture to feel welcomed, to feel invited to arts events. So we really are, start I wouldn't say we're starting from the very beginning but it's quite near there so I think let's really think how we all work together on this email people ask for advice that's how we're all going to gain an understanding um yeah whistle stop tour thank you very much everybody thank you so much Nikki uh brilliant I'm you're you're the quote machine today and I'm loving it uh, Nikki feel free to write your uh, write the notes afterwards rather than um, now so we can have our chat um, our chat uh, Ross it'd be great if I could bring you back into the discussion as well please um, fantastic hello uh, we uh, of course because this is such an amazing in in depth and um, intricate I guess is maybe one of the words topic uh, we have gone slightly uh, over time and but it would be so good to have a quick chat around some of the uh, points that have been raised um, so starting off, uh, Russ, it'd be great to ask around Zara. So uh, one of the questions is, uh, so Zara was super impressive on an epic scale in terms of production, participation and audience. Could you talk to us a bit about the timeline of community engagement for this project and teams um, can prioritise activity and apply this learning to smaller scale projects? Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I would say, um, the yeah, recruitment began in uh, November 2018. So there was approximately two months to get the word out there and uh, yeah, try and infiltrate all the traditional and non-traditional spaces where we could advertise these opportunities. And I would say the actual in-person engagement then took place from January. And then, so that was phase one to three. And then that took us through to mid may when we kind of concluded the the core activity with the um community cast i would say since that project and yeah totally appreciate that this is of a particular scale i would say there have been other projects that i've been involved in or i've seen other people do where it's kind of taking what those pillars are but i suppose shrinking but in shrinking that it's to fit the size of the project rather than compromising on what some of those kind of takeaways or points of quality that I talked about at the end would be. So I would say in terms of a process, 
the way that I've, I've kind of started with it and I've seen other organizations do it is kind of starting with a bit of a, a map and that's how we kind of came up with the phase one, two, 2.5 and three. Um, but within that and however you articulate your plan to work with the, the community, um, I think I a key learning that I would implement with that is give yourself more time than what you think um, in terms of the the needs of the participants and is all of the invisible things that happen outside of those points of engagement I would definitely kind of put more days if you're kind of putting a budget together or project plan more days for kind of responsive uh, needs and kind of working with um, the, the community cast so I hope that answers the question so I, I suppose it's just taking the pillars mapping them out and kind of fitting them to the size of your project and your budget yeah of course i think um one thing through um so i worked with access all areas for many years and uh one thing that i found um most uh, important is around how uh many disabled people have been denied access to training mm. yeah. been denied access to uh, being in a rehearsal space uh being involved in drama projects um and just so that lack of access, that lack of um, uh, information is um, so key. So being yeah. able to um, encourage learned disabled and disabled um, people to participate and be truly part, um, not in a tokenistic way, but in an authentic and meaningful way and really listen to their um, experiences and ideas is really mm. exciting. Um, but then that scaffolding as well, I yes. guess, um, making sure that if someone hasn't had that past experience, those that scaffolding is even more important and allowing additional space and time. Um, Nikki, I wondered if you had any thoughts around um, what tools or tricks you might have uh, for that kind of scaffolding of community cast members. I, think I, I haven't got much more to add, so I think you've both kind of said it. I think it is around... Um... As a disabled person, I hate being a tick box. So I think it's just around knowing the uh, the legacy and longevity of the project, that it isn't just pick me up and then use me and then dump me. Um, and I think it is really key to maybe uh, not see, be surprised if you only get two or three people. Uh, also, have you got money in your budget when you're working with communities to pay for their access, their travel, their transport? Um, cause that's quite vital for them getting there, um, really finding out their access requirements. So you can do that. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it, it's, I would, I would just say, make sure there's continuing conversation with them. Uh, even if sometimes it can be, uh, again, could they feed into part of your kind of artist advisory group, you know, keep building it developing that relationship with them what can it be maybe they might want to be a volunteer for a future festival um so i would say just keep yeah building upon that relationship and uh, and also if you know we all get those emails don't we like this is an opportunity come up make sure they're on that mailing list so they're getting that opportunity from you as well i would say just really keep them engaged as much as possible yeah that's so true and that kind of space for growth and future development and like um and once you've built that positive relationship um don't be thinking around oh next project we need new people it's not always about new it's about that continued relationship um i just think about some of the fantastic artists that i've worked with and how from um from going from community work to then doing a diploma training and then being paid to be in performances mm -hmm. so yeah. wherever possible like maybe this is their first step in or or one of their steps in community engagement, but where's a space in the future for payment? Yeah, and also I think what's delightful is by seeing how those people that have been involved previously become the kind of mentors for the newer company members in the next, you know, year or whatever. Yeah. Like that does become a natural sort of, um, yeah, mentoring that happens. I've seen it a lot working with young people, young disabled people. It's that thing of people that have that confidence can then nurture the next um, generation coming through. Mm. Yeah, and that space for like building those opportunities and building that um, 
uh, that shadowing or that training pack of be- becoming a facilitator mm. uh, yeah, is amazing. Um, and then so kind of building on that um, in terms of audience development and engaging disabled audiences uh, that can sometimes take time to build that trust of communities. Um, what are some of your top tips for developing meaningful relationships with external community groups, charities and partner advocates? Russ, I get you to yeah. <laughs> think about that first. Um, I think in terms of using Zara as an example, I would say we definitely started from a place of knowing I suppose who would the, our, our familiar advocates were within uh, within London. I suppose we might have had um, previous project done previous projects with them or had different kinds of relationships with some of those groups. Um, so I think we definitely started in more of a known place. But I think what was brilliant in especially working with a specialist such as Mind the Gap is that they kind of started to kind of put other people on our radar and other organizations started to put other people on our radar. So when I was saying about reaching out to partners, they nine times out of 10 saying, oh, by the way, have you spoken to so-and-so? And And there was a real generosity in kind of sharing that um, with us. And it kind of just allowed us to kind of, those ripples went much further than just going, this is what we know, so we'll just stick with that. So I think there was a definite, expansion that just happened in um starting that recruitment process but i would say within this project it was by happy accident rather than how do we from the beginning so i think that would be a um a a better if um for next time and i think just going back to what nikki was saying whether it's kind of working with an individual not to feel like a tick box it was the same with working with those organizations it was about more than just can you just give us a fast pass to your participants or to your community? It was very much going, how can we work with you in a meaningful way, not just on this project, but in future projects? So they became a key part of the legacy plan, Uh, but also, especially with groups such as Sardines Dance Collective, that kind of, and that artist development opportunity allowed us to kind of work with them in a continued sense beyond the world of Zara and other projects happened. once again, it just took a bit more of an investment in those relationships to make more happen and for them to get uh, what they needed out of us as well as an NPO organisation, but also what they needed as a development um, opportunity to kind of generate new work or a new collaboration. So it was reciprocal, but we definitely started from that place of also what's in it for you and what do you need? And this is what we need. So, yeah, we mapped it out a bit, I suppose. Right. Um, Nikki, I guess uh, I'm also thinking around specifically like local and because many uh, of the organisations on this call are um, are outside of London and, and really wanting to focus on their local audience. Um, what you said around um, like disability is intersectional and how um, there are disabled people everywhere and there are disabled people in your community, but they may just not be uh, you may not be connecting with them in you may not be using the right tools to connect with them um yeah what would you go for any top tips around that local engagement i think it's that again it's that thing is not going to happen overnight again you really have to invest in it um we're having lots of conversations with data with kind of um different communities and i think it's always that way like and, and something when you are working with another partner organization I think it's around going what's the what's the industry change here for both of you um and how what are your what what's your kind of strategy and your aims Mm -hmm. for for doing that what do you both want to get out of it um and I think that's it whether you're working with a local community organization I think really ask them what would they like to get out of it as well and offer other things such as going in and doing a couple of free workshops every quarter or you know what can you if we're thinking around sort of marketing is there something can you can you advertise things for them can you can you put their um their call outs out as well it's it's a mutual thing um i'm always really conscious that i won't approach a a community unless i'm really sure of what it is i'm asking from them uh and i really interrogate why am i doing this 
who is it for and why now with everything that I do and I think that's what you have to ask yourself when you're looking to work with a community group and also do we have the capacity to to do it um to do to do it productively and to do it well um I hate the kind of feeling of and I suppose this is what I was thinking of earlier that thing of well it's just disabled people it doesn't have to be good um I've heard that many times in my career and that is so wrong um so I think it's around really make sure you have got the capacity and you are you have a team around you that's dedicated to it that you're not just the lone soldier going out there because there's nothing worse is there than it's you prepared to do this work the rest of the organization aren't following so I would say just make sure it's a complete it, it's there within your organization it's part of the organizational culture that this is what you all want to work towards yeah, that's so vital, isn't it? Is that getting access on everyone's agenda on if you've got multiple budgets and every single budget, there should yeah. be a line around access. Yeah. It's just as important as marketing. Yeah, Ross. Can I just add a point? To, yeah, that's such a good point. And just to say, and I put the details in the chat bar, when we had the inclusivity training run by Totally Inclusive People, it was really important that that offer obviously wasn't just for the community cast, but everyone in the organisation from artistic director to finance assistant every, the, everyone invested that time in it and it felt right to do that and it wasn't as you were saying Alex kind of this more optional type of engagement it's like no this is this is culture and this is a company-wide decision and I think really kind of imbuing that in the organization as well as the project is really really important so I would definitely say that was another big um, key moment for us during this project. Yeah, it's that kind of going beyond uh, statements like we are inclusive and saying yeah. we are anti-ableist yeah. and like working on that actively. And I think as well, interrogate the ableism that you have within your organisation. Yeah. I'm constantly doing it as a disabled person. Why do I feel like that? Oh yeah, that's because I've been brought up to feel like that because of living in a very non-disabled world. And I think engaging your organization to do the same. Uh, and don't ever think that it's like, oh, we can't do that, it costs too much money. No, it doesn't. Things can be done quite simply. We've got, we have many devices now as I lift up my mobile phone of like what we can record audio description on. It, you know, let's not think we have to have a recording studio to do it iPhone microphones are just as good sometimes. It's like, what, what can be achieved? If you're making a show for a certain community, get someone from that community to do that voiceover. Like it's, it's re to me, it's, it's not rocket science. It's just that, how, how is access informing your art? How does art inform the access? Um, and I think that's key across everything. Yeah, and there's like that creative opportunity to engage more people and to um, work with more people. And obviously in this uh, funding application, there's the opportunity to have someone uh, leading outreach workshops. Why don't you, that person be a disabled person, be from your community? And then thinking around, you could also potentially add in some training sessions or additional meetings uh, with your team so that, that person feels confident and has the tools to succeed in that. Um, Kat, is there any um, examples of practice, especially as you said, we've had uh, multiple applications over the last few years of audience development, um, ones that you think have done particularly well? Oh, sorry, you're on mute, Kat. <laughs> I think one that's um, been particularly successful, we did a project with uh, First Art in Mansfield uh, last year, over 2020. Um, and it sort of came to a head this year, finished this year. Um, and first out worked with uh, Daryl Beaton, who Nikki knows really well, um, who is a disabled artist himself. And he worked um, to lead kind of creative workshops um, and um, sort of co-creation uh, sessions with the local disabled community there to look at um, what sort of this idea of what the new normal looks like. Um, as we were going through the pandemic, there was a lot of talk around, you know, let's get back to normal, but actually recognising that, you know, normal wasn't right for everyone. Um, so um, Daryl and First Out worked with the community in Mansfield to, you know, just challenge perceptions around that. And they created um, some really wonderful um, sort of animations and video productions that they ended up um, exhibiting across shopping centres in Mansfield, um, across their social media channels, part of the festivals and events. 
um, and it really helped raise awareness of people's different e experiences not only just during the pandemic but prior to that and how we can kind of move forward out of the pandemic into a you know a society that is a lot more inclusive um, and you know much more creative for everyone um, and that was a really kind of um, inspiring project I thought and, and was really well thought out in the sense like as you mentioned Alex it brought in you know someone with lived experience to kind of help lead those sessions who who knew how to kind of direct um you know the the creative um direction of of the work um but also um just empower the people that he's working with because he knew you know what the challenges that they were facing um and yeah they they've since kind of used that project it was actually a project that they de developed and um, they were supposed to do another project which got sort of put on hold because of the pandemic, which was improving accessibility at the festival. And I'm really glad that they kind of thought about it. We continue to kind of shape this project instead, because actually doing that consultation with this community during that time has now led to kind of a stronger understanding of how to improve accessibility at the festival going forward now, and um, which is what they've done this year in a project. So what I'd say is when applying for this, you know, do think of that legacy of the project that you're doing now and, you know, what would be the next step? What does the future look like um, for that particular audience that you're working with? Um, and yeah, that for me, that was probably one of the, a really inspiring project from the, the past year. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants to talk to me about it or get in touch with Mansfield as well um, at first, I'm sure they'd be happy to share some of their experience. Thank you so much, Kat. And I think, yeah, like you said, those building blocks and building that legacy, um, I think sometimes there's a daunting challenge of um, trying to do everything in one go. And actually it's okay to trial a few things and um, see where your capacity is because I found that if I do something one year, then I've built that into my capacity for next year and then I can grow a little bit. And those little steps of growth are, are, are so vital. Um, rather than just thinking an all or nothing mentality. Um, I think we've had some amazing conversations and there's so much, so much further to go. Um, I guess one of the things that uh, I'm thinking around is when you are doing these uh, activities and your engagement and your community engagement, making sure that you are, so a mistake that I've made in the past is not then connecting that to our programme. And I think what Nikki said around um, making sure that disabled people are part of your programme, but also if you're doing community engagement work, sometimes, sometimes it's a different department, sometimes it's maybe one person, a team, and uh, bringing those conversations into your, uh, into your team meetings and using the marketing material. Then if you've got other events going on, how do you organize trips to your other events? Because there may be a barrier in transportation. So building that in, you've now built your audience in uh, integrated ways and think about how that crosses across your whole festival. Because I know I've definitely been like, oh, I forgot all those people I did an amazing project with haven't come and seen some other of our events. Ridiculous. Uh, but it's one of those things that gets lost in the, the time field of this past two years, I reckon. Um, Nikki, is there anything like final uh, sentence or, I mean, if you build it, they will come has already been a great quote, but um, some more quotes from you, Nikki. No, I think I'm all out of quotes today. <laughs> I, just, I also just want to say, like, don't be afraid to get it wrong. Even me as a disabled person with lived experience, I get it wrong. Uh, and that's cool because then I go, I'm going to work on that for next time. Like you say, Alex, don't you don't have to do it all at once. Uh, I mean, yeah, I probably get like 75, 80% of my work right, but it'll be the 20% that I will like really focus on because I'm an artist so I take criticism as like my next thing um so I think it is that you don't be afraid to fail and through failing is how we get better and I think then you know analyze what failed how can we make that better um what what worked what didn't work how can we how how do we do the basic and then build up from there um yeah, yeah I hope that's no that's so important and actually something that like building on that building uh is something that i thought around last year was how we shared that with the audiences that that's affected um we don't have to keep our evaluations in our share points or drop boxes put that available out um show that to your audience and show that in particular have conversations with people that that's effective affected 
it may even be like a need to apologize and say, look, how can we work with you better next year? Uh, how can we make this work for you next year? What can we do? Um, but then also there's a trouble with that is then also not putting that trauma, not putting that um, free uh, learning from that person onto, onto them. So making sure that you are paying that person for that consultancy time um, or thinking around what you can do to compensate that person. Um, and if they don't want to be involved again, then you, you've got to allow that as well. Yeah, uh, Ross, any final thoughts? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'd, I'd just echo exactly uh, what you've just said. I think sometimes when we have these experiences, everything's kept internal and there might be some really genuine conversations happening like, yeah, that there was a bit of a, um, that didn't go as well, or let's learn from that. Why did that? And it gets shared internally, but sometimes there's that lack of bravery to go from beyond the internal, uh, the internal to put it outwards. Because I think in doing that, it is kind of making uh, everyone seem more human. And I think we have a responsibility as individuals and organizations to be a bit more upfront going, this, we're gonna share our experiences, but not just the shiny high art moments it's going it, what were the pitfalls because I think that is so much more useful sometimes for other people to understand and learn from than going here's just a really impressive bit of high art that we stuck here and I think for me now I'm much more interested in shit trying to be more upfront it's not perfect but getting better at yeah, these are the bits that didn't go well. And this is what we're doing differently next time. Be really interesting to hear. And it kind of opens up a conversation also, whether you do it on social media or you're just doing it in a meeting context or wherever it might be. I just think, yeah, we should be better at saying where things didn't go as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's owning it, I suppose. Yeah, and that owning it can be really hard as well. Yeah. Um, I just would say thank you so much for all these uh, fantastic uh, conversations. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited uh, for our audience to make some notes as to where they, what the actions they want to take uh, and think about where they want to go with this, uh, how they can start or continue, continue to build their audience um, and see who, already you're, who are you working with already and how that can be built. Uh, this audience development uh, fund, you don't have to do something completely new. It can be something that is a building block from something you've done before and be like, oh, I've worked with George last year and he came to an event and he was amazing. I'd love to put this grant in to uh, pay for him to go and do some workshops with, uh, within his community, you know, or, or whoever it may be. Uh, Kat, is there any final things around... Uh, could you just remind us of the deadline for that and where we can find the application form and the next steps, please? Yeah, so the deadline for the Audience Development Fund is Friday the 4th of March. Um, you should have all been sent um, the application form and the guidance notes, or at least your sort of um, lead contacts for Without Walls will have received that. But if you haven't, feel free to um, drop me a separate email and I'll, I'll send that over to you. Um, in terms of kind of top tips of, of what to look out for, um, I would say, um, you know, make your actual application form accessible. You know, if you were to present that to a community group or someone that you wanted to work with, does that make sense to them? Um, so, you know, avoid art speak. Um, often I receive applications um, that have, have sort of been taken directly from a kind of manifesto of a local authority or something like that. Do feel free to break it down and, and add really encourage you all to just be as creative as possible and have fun with it and um, because if you're having fun with it and you enjoy what you're sort of investing into I think the people that you're trying to attract will as well. Great thank you so much and uh, thank you to all of our audience as well have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks so much everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.